This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of November 28th, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we take a look at what we expect this coming session from the new bipartisan Senate majority. Second, we discuss what's going on with oil prices and what that likely means for this coming session. And third, we discuss where Alaska's industrial policy is headed next and who is leading it. And now let's join Michael. So the weekly top three, let's uh, let's dive into this because this is the one that I've been waiting for uh, since the end of last week uh, as I read some of the things that were coming out. And I mean, I tried to stay unplugged all weekend, but you can't avoid everything. And of course, the commentary on uh, the social media is about the, the, the Senate uh, uh, majority announcement and everything else that all came out. So let's start off there. The Senate and um, where we're going from here, the bipartisan Senate majority with nine Democrats and eight Republicans. Interesting. Uh, what do you say? Well, I think uh, after the election results, it probably wasn't uh, surprising. I'm a little bit surprised at uh, James Kaufman, who uh, at one time seemed to be a fairly strong Republican, and and um, and Jesse Bjorkman and some others uh, uh, crossing over and and joining the coalition. But it, it was clearly going to be a a, a a bipartisan coalition from the time we got to, from the time we got the election results. Um, I think what it means um, is that we're going to be spending. Um, with the, the, the announcement uh, that uh, Senator Stevens, uh, when he announced the, uh, the majority, he said the new Senate majority's top issues will be lowering energy costs, improving education, and revitalizing the economy, leaders stated in a press release and subsequent press uh, conference uh, Friday evening in Anchorage. Um, and those three things are spending lower energy costs. I assume they mean by that, uh, renewables picking up on the governor's uh, pitch for renewables, uh, and, uh, and somehow creating incentives, uh, for, uh, for additional renewables, maybe spending some on the, uh, uh, on the, uh, uh the main line between Fairbanks, the, the, the road system main line between Fairbanks and Anchorage and down to Homer, uh, to ensure that it's, uh, able to, uh, take on uh, additional renewables wherever they come on the system. Um, and so energy costs, uh, I think, means spending. Improving education, that certainly uh, means spending. In the discussion that, uh, that these people had during the campaign and, um, and since it's been about we need to spend more to, 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 uh, to help K, K through 12. I mean, some people would say, oh, improve education. Well, that means, you know, cutting out administrators and, and, uh, and, and being more efficient about what we're doing. But I don't think that's what the Senate majority uh, has in mind when they uh, talk about improving education. And the third one is uh, revitalizing the economy. Um, and since um, a, a lot of these folks think that the government drives the economy. Uh, that's, that that's the government's is- job, right? I mean, to create the economy and to make jobs and to do all, instead of get out of the way. Yeah, I think uh, I think that uh, I think that's we're, we're going to see some proposals for uh, for spending uh, in terms of uh, revitalizing the economy, whatever whatever that means. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the third segment when we get to talking about ADA. 
but uh, but those those are the three priorities. Where does the uh, PFD fit in all that? Well, there's a quote. <laughs> there's a quote. quote. <laughs> it's my there's favorite quote, quote already. <laughs> it's a quote from Giesel in um, uh, in in the ADN, um, and here it is: We're all committed to the largest dividend that that we can afford, <laughs> but we also know that there are state services that are critical to Alaskans. Education probably comes to the forefront of our thoughts, said Giggle, G- Giesel. Giggle. You said Giesel. Yeah, so, all, Giesel. All, so all of that, all of that has to be weighed out, she said. So <laughs> uh, we, we've, we've elected a, a state Senate, at least, that's going to be committed to the largest dividend <laughs> that we can afford, which is the old leftover dividend. Um, it, it's a, it, it's, it's fascinating the evolution, uh, that Giesel's gone through from her time as a, when she was first elected to the Senate, when I supported her, uh, for right. her election to the Senate in, uh, in 2010 and, and all the way through to, uh, to where she is now. Um, it's not, it's not the same person. It's not. Well, it's I not- remember that. I mean, Brad, I remember the commercial that she did where it was her and her husband sitting at their kitchen table and she steals her husband's wallet and puts it down there and says, they're stealing money from your dividend and they're doing this and that. And I don't know what happened. I mean, metamorphosis used that word earlier. It is truly, I mean, it was a, it is a metamorphosis from how did she go from, they're stealing your PFD and we're going to get it back to we're going to give you a dividend that you can, that we can afford that because we know better than you how to spend all this money. So I, Michael, sometimes people, when they're describing Senator Hoffman, Senator Lyman Hoffman, they use the term, whatever it takes to stay in power. Um, And I think, I think we may see that we may be seeing that with Giesel also. I mean, it's, it's, she started out willing to be in the minority. In fact, you know, almost creating the minority uh, and and certainly uh, an aggressive advocate for the minority. Minority, minority. It was four of them, I think, uh, back in the back in the day. Yeah. And and she was, you know, that was she was perfectly fine with that. It was almost David Eastman like, in terms of, you know, I want to be in the more minority. I, I I think I can do uh, stuff in the minority. And and from there, we've gone all the way to. Uh, where she is now, which I think, frankly, is explained by whatever it takes to to be in power, whatever it takes to to be in control, that that she can direct direct the outcome. An ego thing, maybe. Uh, a uh, uh, you know, I, I know better than anybody, so I need to be in power so I can direct the outcome, sort of regardless of, of whatever that is. Um, but it's um, it, it's an interesting it's an interesting evolution from uh, from where she started out, but. I mean that it's it it is it is what it is, and and I think we're facing a Senate that is going to be driven by, by spending. You you were talking earlier about you know maybe if the House uh, uh, organizes as a Repub- as Republicans, maybe we get into a bit of gridlock between the Senate and the House. I agree that there's going that there's the potential for some of that, but I think even the House, even if the Republicans organize the House. I think the House is going to be is going to be driven by some of these things. They're going to want to respond to uh, energy issues. They're going to respond. Want to respond to uh, uh, education issues, K through twelve issues. It's going to be a big drive out of Anchorage to to do that. So I think I think there's I think we're seeing in both bodies um, a desire to uh, to to spend and to uh, and to push government agenda forward. Gov- government is being the savior uh, forward. I, nobody really knows. I mean, we, we've had all this recent spate right before the election, <laughs> as is usually the case. <laughs> this recent spate of articles on, you know, the economy is in horrible shape. Alaska is 50th in the nation in terms of the economy. Our GDP's down and, 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 a, and a lot of other factors. Nobody really knows what it takes to get the Alaska economy going again, other than, other than oil projects. I mean, we, we do know that. Um, but, but other than that, we don't, nobody knows really what it takes to get the Alaska economy going. So I think we're going to see a lot of spinning wheels about, uh, trying to get the economy started. A lot of discussion about it. Uh, there'll be those who say, well, that's, that's really part of the reason why we need to increase education spending, both K through 12 and, um, uh, higher ed spending, because that will drive the economy. I mean, look at Harvard, Harvard drives the Boston economy. Right. We're going to. We're going to see we're going to see a lot of of that sort of, of of that sort of articulation. 
and what happens in that situation is people just want to spend. I mean, they want to sh- they want to they want to demonstrate that they're doing something, that they recognize there's an issue, and they and they want to demonstrate they're doing something about it. Uh, and uh, and and I, and the drive is going to be the impetus is going to be to uh, to spend going forward. So even if there is a, a a Republican organization in the House, it's going to be a very thin one. Uh, and there's going to be uh, House members who are going to be, you know, want to want to spend more on education, want to spend, want to demonstrate that they're doing something about about the economy and about energy costs. Um, and I think there's going to be a push to spend more. And we know the governor, the, the term we've used in previous shows is round heels. The governor has round heels. He'll <laughs> s- 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 he'll since ride that first. Just that he'll he'll rock back and he'll you know he'll agree to stuff and. And uh, and I think we're going to end up with a with a higher budget uh, higher budget than we want. The issue, uh, I think, for me, the issue is going to be who pays. I mean, it's going to be every day. Uh, I'm going to say something about who's paying for all this. And if you use PFD cuts, like we've talked about on the show uh, a number of times, if you use PFD cuts, it's middle and lower income Alaska families. So you've got people like Giesel, people like Stevens, uh, with his uh, state pension. Um, uh, others who are fairly well off in the legislature going, yeah, we need to spend more. Uh, we need to, we need to push forward, but I don't want to pay for it. <laughs> so, so let's use PFD cuts, um, and, and push the cost of middle and lower income Alaska families. And I think that's to me, uh, if there is, if there is a way of slowing this train down, um, the spending train down, it is to talk about who's paying. And to talk about the inequity uh, of of who's paying for all of this increased spending, and and to say, look, you know, if you want to spend this additional amount, then it needs to be broad based. We need to we need to involve the top twenty percent. We need to involve non residents, um, and we need to have uh, we need to have a broad based uh, uh, spending or broad based revenue uh, to support this spending. It all, it shouldn't all just be piled up again on top of middle and lower income uh, Alaska families. And, you know, the, the, as we talked about on the show before, I think if we're successful in that or if, if, that, if that threat is real, um, I think the top 20% start saying, whoa, 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 wait, wait a second. <laughs> we, we don't want to pay for this stuff. This is not stuff that we want. I mean, it's great as long as somebody else is paying for it. It's wonderful as long as middle and lower income Alaska families have to pay the bill. But you want us to pay for it? You want us to pay a share of it? Well, you know, let's take, let's take a look at these costs. Um, and I think that's where I think that's where the pushback in this session is. I mean, there's going to be those who say no spending, you know, stop spending, you know, draw the line. No more. No more dollars. That lost that that, that train left the station that 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 position lost in this election. Just look at Giesel. Right. Just look just look at the weather vane. Well, that we've lost. talked about we've talked about standing in the middle of the street and shouting holding our fist out or hand out to the, to the thing, no more spending stop. And then they just run you over because they've got control of the legislature. They've got control of these things and they're just pushing it forward, whether you like it or not. I think that comes back. I think the, I think the stop spending, get costs under control. I think that urge comes back. If you get the top 20% involved in, in having to be, uh, among those who who pay for it, um, they're the you know the donor class. They're the ones that have the ear of the legislators. They're the ones that hire the lobbyists uh, that are operating down in Juneau. If if they have to, if the top twenty percent has to pay, uh, or believe they're going to have to pay for some of this stuff, then uh, then I think we get uh, pushback. But other than that, um, the, uh, the 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 stop spending crew, I think uh, I think lost this election cycle. And and Giesel, I mean, the, the, the terminology here, the largest dividend that we can afford after we've spent every after we've spent it all on 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 other things. I mean, that's the that's the clear signal. That's where they want to go. They want to push the cost down on middle and lower income Alaska families. So it it's it's going to be I mean, this is going to be a session of of pushing back and finding ways to pushing back and, and effective ways of pushing back as opposed to just, as you say, standing in the middle of the road and saying, no, 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 no. And, and, you know, getting tire tracks all over you. Right. Well, let me, let me ask you this, because again, this is the, you, you hit the quote. This is the one that I've been running with since this article came out, you know, we're all committed to the largest dividend that we can afford. And of course, remember 
this next session, we're not going to have high oil money, more than likely. We're not going to have a huge amount of oil money coming in. Uh, we're not going to have a bunch of federal money from the COVID stimulus or anything else that's coming in. And so when they say the highest dividend that you could afford and we're expecting increased spending, um, I mean, we're talking about maybe a $500 dividend. We're talking maybe maybe 1000 but I mean, I would be super surprised. But then, then that leads to my question, and I know we've got to get to two and three, but this leads to my question of what does that look like in the future? I mean, how long until the dividend is just flat gone and then they want to spend even more? Well, Michael, we we know the answer to that. I mean, we, we look at 2013 forward when uh, when the, the savings accounts, the CBR and the SBR were the dividend. They, they were the they were the, the as much as we can afford uh, 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 component of the equation. They were the proxy, right? They were the proxy for what we have happened today, right? And and they got spent away. Um, you know, if you don't get pushback from the top twenty percent, if you don't have all Alaska families, particularly the donor class, involved in saying stop, stop uh, on on the spending, it just keeps going. And and we saw that in the in the in the twenty tens, we saw. Oh, we'll just spend a little bit more. We'll we'll get it under control next year. Don't don't worry. You know we're committed to getting it spending under control. But but we got the savings account this year. We really you know and we're in a recession or or you know the sky is purple today or something. You know some reason we need to spend more, just a little bit more, and we'll just drain the savings down a little bit more. But we'll get it under control. Don't don't worry about it. And we went through the entire 2020 teen, 20 teens uh, doing that, and the savings kept going down and down and down and down and down and down and down until they're gone. And, and that's, you know, that's, that's the perfect uh, analogy, the perfect proxy, the perfect lesson about what's going to happen uh, to the PFD. Here's my question for you, Brad. Um, if, because we're looking at the makeup of the Senate coalition right now, and of course it's nine Democrats, right? Over eight Republicans. Now they say, well, we, we need 11 to make anything goes to the floor. And I mean, uh, but how much uh how much how how hard do you think we're going to see a push uh as they realize that they're going to take all of the dividend and there's going to be some political pushback on that how much of a push do you think we're going to see for changes to the oil tax structure um wh what do you think is going to happen i mean are we going to see a proposal for an sb21 repeal which wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing uh but i mean what what are we what are your, what's your take on that yeah, so we are going to see a push uh, by some for oil taxes. Um, the um, it's it's unlikely to get out of the Senate. I mean, Giesel made sure that she is not only the majority leader, but she is co-chair of uh, of Senate Resources uh, with uh, with Senator Bishop. Um, so I, it's unlikely to get out of the Senate. But we are going to see a push for oil taxes. And here's here it's it. I think we discussed this last week. It's it's sort of a kabuki theater. I mean, it's going to be. Frankly, it, it, it's a top twenty percent misdirect. Uh, they're they're going to they're going to be saying, "Oh, well, if we need a bigger PFD, then we're just going to have to have to expand oil taxes. We're going to have to redo oil taxes." And and the push will be, if you want a bigger PFD, you're going to have to fight with the uh, with the oil companies uh, and blame the oil companies if we don't if you don't get a bigger bigger PFD. Um, so it's going to be it's going to be in the mix um, if the House goes. Uh, coalition, probably more coming from the House than from the Senate, but it's going to be in the mix, but it's going to be an attempt at a misdirect. It's going to be attempt an attempt to blame the lower PFD or or the lack of a of a of a statute, certainly a statutory PFD or even a POMV 5050 PFD to blame that on the uh blame that on the on the oil company. So you know at the end of the day the legislators can say don't like your PFD. I tried. But it was the oil companies who pushed back, and it's the oil companies' fault that you didn't get the, your big, bigger PFD, not me. Um, so I think I think we're going to see some of that. I, if it somehow got through the legislature, I mean, <laughs> you, you got to sort of you got to sort of think through these things. If it somehow got through the legislature, um, a, a oil tax uh, revival, and then Governor Dunleavy vetoed it, then the Democrats have the perfect world. It's like, well, we tried. We tried to get we tried to get a a, a bigger PFD uh, uh, we by passing uh, increased oil taxes, but the governor vetoed it. So 
You want to blame some somebody for the level of your PFD? Blame it on the governor for vetoing what we got through. It's gonna it's gonna be used as as this foil out there uh, that's to blame for the PFD. Now you and I know, and and everybody listening knows, the PFD is not dependent on oil taxes. The PFD is fully paid for. It's covered by permanent fund earnings. That's what the statute says. That's what uh, that's what the the numbers say. PFD doesn't need any additional funding. But uh, that's not the rhetoric we're going to hear as we go through this legislature. The rhetoric we're going to hear about uh, by both uh, 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 Republicans and Democrats, I think, is going to be, yeah, yeah. if if you want a bigger PFD, we're going to have to do something about oil taxes. The other thing, we didn't really get to this last program, but the other thing um, is that Willow and the Willow and the Pika projects are going to play in this, right? The oil companies are going to go, well, you want an economy? You want to grow the economy? Then... The Willow and the Pika projects are the way to do that. And by gosh, if you pass these oil taxes, we're not going to make those investments. So, you know, you're going to you're going to drive us out of state. You're going to put that investment money someplace else. Um, so everybody sort of got their own, you know, role already carved out in this Kabuki theater uh, all over the uh, all over, you know, the PFD uh, of uh, of trying to, you know, frame oil taxes as the solution to the PFD or uh, frame oil taxes as the death to uh, to the Alaska economy by, economy by undermining uh, Willow and Pika. Um, it's all a misdirect to, to avoid confronting the fact that at the same time as they're doing all that, the legislature is taxing the heck out of the PFD and diverting it, uh, diverting it off, uh, off to government. Uh, we are... Um... We're what, 20, we're 16 days from the governor having to produce a budget. Um, And James asks a valid question. Square one is what the governor will put in the budget for his PFD. Last year, he started with a cut down POMV 50-50. So, I mean, I know the legislature, but do you think Dunleavy tries to stand strong on this and puts a full PFD in? um and goes from there i mean what what are your thoughts on that quickly here i got less than 45 seconds yep he'll put a pomv 50 50 in and then he'll play with inflation factors and all sorts of other things to make to make it look like it fits it doesn't uh but he'll uh he'll put that in uh, and and uh, and that'll be his uh his starting point so the pomv you don't think a full statutory you think it'll be a no. 50 no, okay. no. The, the, the governor's going to stick with his POMV 50-50. He can't, he, even he can't make the budget balance if he right. pulls in a, puts in a full statutory PFD and doesn't increase revenue uh, someplace else. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We need to move on to number two, Brad. I guess give me a quick 20-second uh, tease here about number two. What's going on with the price of oil? Well, number two is is what's going on with the price of oil. And, and we're going to talk... I mean, the price of oil is going to be a big issue this legislature. Uh, a year ago, you and I talked about oil prices are up. That's going to mean uh, something for the legislature. Well, now we're going to talk about oil prices being down and what that means for the legislature this coming session. And it uh, doesn't mean good things for the PFD. So we'll talk about that in the second segment. We're on to number two, which is what's going on with oil prices and <laughs> what, what, where do we go from here on that? Brad uh, Keithley, our guest uh, here this morning. Brad, uh, let's. Uh, where do we start off here? Well, last year at this time, Michael, you and I were talking about oil, oil prices going up, uh, and the legislature was going to uh, have to confront the fact that revenues were going to be in a lot stronger shape than they than they had been uh, uh, for the past few years. And we spent a number of segments uh, talking about various aspects of that. This year, I'm afraid we're going to be talking about oil prices going down relative to where they were uh, uh, at this time last year. Uh, oil prices going down, and uh, and and what that's going to mean uh, uh, for for the legislature. Um, every morning, uh, uh, well, six days a week, we take Sundays off, but every morning, uh, six days a week, we 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 post what we call the eight thirty eight thirty a.m. chart, and the eight thirty a.m. chart is is sort of a running look at uh, oil prices to date, uh, combined with uh, what the futures market is telling us where uh, oil prices are heading uh, tomorrow. And, or heading in the future. And uh, today, this morning's chart has uh, fiscal year 23, the current fiscal year we're in, uh, at $89 oil. Uh, that's compared to a budget uh, that's based on $101 oil. Uh, recall that at $87, uh, we run through the C, the, the SBR, uh, and we're uh, and and we're now into into needing a CBR draw. 
uh, the very little CBR we have left, the CBR draw in order to uh, in order to balance the budget. That'll be its its own issue if that if that's what happens. But right now we're at eighty nine dollars. Um, next year, fiscal year twenty four, uh, the futures market tells us we're at eighty dollars uh, for the for for the year uh, compared again to one hundred and one uh, that that this year's budget is based on. Uh, the, uh, the outlook that the legend, that the, uh, spring revenue forecast had for, uh, FY 24 was $90. So we're $10 below where the spring revenue forecast told us we were going to be. So you're, you're, we're in a situation where oil prices and, and thus oil revenues are coming down, um, and spending is, uh, is on a trajectory, uh, to go up <laughs> that, that leads to, leads to deficits. Um, so in a way, second, isn't this very reminiscent of the Parnell administration? Remember the Parnell administration? I think it was in 2013 or 2014, where they produced a budget that was based on $115 a barrel oil and oil had cratered down into the low seventies, low high sixties. And he's like, yep, this is the budget that we're putting forward. I mean, doesn't it, it doesn't, it, isn't it reminiscent of that same time, but yet we don't have the $15 billion in savings to back it up. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly right. And that's why, you know, in our previous discussion, that's why we talked about the PFD becoming the grease that uh, that gets caught, uh, gets caught in the middle, like savings did during the 20 teens. Um, oil prices. There, there was a great article in the Financial Times yesterday for anybody. It's a free free access. This article is free access for anybody that really wants to understand what's going on with oil prices. It was a terrific article. Talks about the downward pressures being the economy, um, uh, the the potential for a recession, uh, a global recession, and the and the effect that that's having on uh, demand and, and thus the effect on oil prices. It talks about what's going on in China with COVID, COVID restrictions and the and the, uh, uh, the, the 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 fall in the Chinese economy or the fall in Chinese demand and and dragging oil prices down. And then it talks about other factors. And and basically, Michael, here here's the the, the point is nobody knows where oil prices are going to go. Uh, we're going to have a high amount of uncertainty uh, as we go uh, go into the spring. But the futures market, which is what the administration, I think, correctly uses as their bellwether for uh, for what oil prices are doing. The futures market is telling us that they're going to stay down. You know, people with money who invest who invest in these things are telling us that uh, uh, that oil prices are, are going to stay down for the for the foreseeable future. So uh, that's the that's the scenario or that's the the baseline, the factual baseline that we're going to come into the into the session with. And it's going to be it's going to be a difficult session in terms of revenues, which will create some activity over on, you know, let's go after oil taxes, push back from Willow and Pika, sort of blocking that. Um, and then and then, you know, well, we got to spend we got to spend on K through 12. We got to spend, you know, on energy. We got to spend on you know restarting the economy. Um, and, and so where are you going to go? I mean, if the, if we're unwilling to talk about broadening the revenue base, if we're unwilling to talk about all Alaska families contributing to the costs, if we're unwilling to talk about having non-residents pay the 7 to 10 percent they would pay if we used a broad-based tax, uh, if we're unwilling to have that discussion, it's the PFD. It's the PFD that's get, that gets squeezed. So um, it shouldn't be the case. PFDs are paid, you know, for the 50th time. Uh, PFDs are paid from permanent fund earnings. The PFDs are fully funded. There's no problem with the funding base for the PFD. You can pay a statutory PFD and not have, not, not cross any lines, but because that we're, we're into this, into this mode where, uh, we're going to tax the PFD to pay for, uh, for government spending, uh, lower oil prices are going to mean, uh, more pressure on the PFD, significantly more pressure on the PFD. And it doesn't look like doesn't look like anybody is uh, is is going to press for you know trying to get the top twenty percent involved yet. So, um, oil oil prices are going to be a big factor this session, but they're going to be a depressing factor this session. I know that this discussion, and we touched on it briefly earlier, but um, you know that's the thing. The governor, we need we need more revenues. We need a well, we need different revenues is what we need. We need to stop dragging from the permanent fund. And I'm a little disheartened to think that the governor is not going to come. As you point out, the funding for the PFD is there. The funding for the PFD is viable. It's the earnings reserve account. I mean, the money's there. The question is, can they control 
their their appetite for spending? We think the answer is obviously no, but uh, I mean, it means that we're going to have to find some. I mean, and there's going to be no discussion on the fiscal policy working group uh, ideas. You know, there's going to be no <clears throat> where we could take three or four hundred million out of the oil industry and new in you know taxes that are still on the table that I think are viable. Uh, there's no talk about a sales tax or a flat tax or anything else. There's no talk about efficiencies. It's just going to be a full run for the border at this point. There is. There's no stopping point. Um, you know, it's sort of like it's sort of like savings. There was no stopping point. There was no point at which you could say you can't go any further than this because you know we violate some covenant or or you know the Constitution puts a prohibition on on draining savings uh, uh, more than that amount. There's no stopping point. And we saw in the 20 teens what happens when there's no stopping point. You just, you come up with different rationalizations every year, but it's a rationalization about why you need to drain uh, savings further. There's no stopping point with the PFD. I mean, once you broke in, once they broke into it, and once they started taxing it, once they started diverting uh, 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 money from uh, the private sector through the PFD into government, which is the classic definition of tax, once they broke into it, uh, there's no stopping point uh, in, unless the governor, you know, digs in his heels and says, no more. I'm going to veto anything that's predicated on taking any more out of the PFD than uh, than this um, has 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 strong heels as opposed to round heels. Um, right. Unless unless that happens, uh, there's no stopping point. And so it's just a little bit just like we went through in the 20 teens. It's just a little bit every year. Um, as we as we go down through it, to me, the thing that stops it, the thing that stops spending, is if all Alaskans have to contribute to the cost of government spending. If it can't be pushed off on middle and lower income Alaskans, if all Alaskans, including the top twenty percent, have to contribute, then I think we see people saying, "Whoa, whoa, 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 whoa!" I, you know, it was fine if you want if you wanted to spend somebody else's money on that project, but don't spend mine. I mean, no, I'm not going to give you any more revenue. Stop spending. Uh, but there needs to be there needs to be a stopping point uh, on the PFD uh, uh, in order to uh, in order to do that. So um, I, hopefully the governor, uh, uh, you know, you would hope the governor digs in. The gov governor has a has a sharp heels and uh, and digs in and, and gets ready to, you know, fend off anybody who wants to spend more. Uh, predicated on uh, on deeper cuts than uh, 50 50 to the POMB 50 50 to the PFD that he calls that his stopping point and his his bottom line but you know he uh, he didn't do it uh, uh, the the couple of years before we got into big money uh, last year uh, we'll see if, uh, if if his second term has uh, has changed him well, and I guess that's the thing. Does he want to be known as the guy that tried to protect the PFD? I mean, again, gaming this out, and we've only got a couple minutes, but gaming this out, let's say Dunleavy wants to run for Senate, for the U.S. Senate, because mm -hmm. you and I talked about that here recently, you know, mm -hmm. running for the U.S. Senate. Let's say that he wanted to do that. Uh, does he want to be known as the guy that tried to save the PFD and win some kudos there and, like you said, you know, brings the red pen out and does that? Or you know, or what does that, does that, how does that affect in the long run? I think, I think if he wants to leave a legacy, I, 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 I think he just sort of rocks. If he, if what his real plan is, is to run against Lisa in six years, I think he just sort of rocks along these next four years, the same way he did the last four years. Um, and really tries just, just to stay out of the headlines and to avoid, you know, getting a recall petition filed against him. I think he just sort of rocks along the same way. If he wants to leave a legacy, though, if he, I mean, a lot of people have said he's the first Republican to be reelected as governor since Jay Hammond. Well, if he wants to be the 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 Jay Hammond of uh, the next Jay Hammond, if he wants to leave a legacy, then he needs to protect the PFD. He needs to to lock in, get those sharp heels, dig in, and say POMV fifty fifty is it. If you're going to do something beyond that, you raise revenue someplace else. Not my fault. I'm ready to cut. If you need, uh, if you, but if you need it, if you want additional spending, you need to raise additional revenues, legislature, and uh, and and go to it. Uh, if you think you need to tax the oil companies, go to it. If you if if you're ready to finally have all Alaskans pay for it, uh, uh, go to it. But but somebody, if, if he wants to leave a legacy, that's what he does. He digs in his heels and says, "I'm fighting for 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 the POMB 5050. That's my red line. We're not we're not going to go across that." Um, 
Hope, hopefully that's hopefully that's what he does at some point. Um, I'm not I'm not entirely sure that's that's in his nature, but but he's he's really he's really the only one right now who's who's in government who's able to do that. And it's not going to be the Senate. We already know that they're going to run it down like they did the savings in the 20 teens. <coughs> Likely not going to be the House. So it's really up to the governor if he wants to leave a legacy to uh, to lock in uh, and uh, and defend that red line. Let me turn this back up. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, uh, our guest talking about uh, where we go from here. I, um, God, I, I would I would hope that this is the direction that we're going to go, Brad. But I. I don't have much faith, unfortunately, in uh, the governor uh, or in this legislature that there's going to be any kind of uh, restrictions, that there's going to be any kind of uh, of uh, containment on this spending. And I unfortunately think that we're going to see a lot more of it. So we'll have to we'll have to watch it. All right. Well, let's move on to number three, which is uh, where's Alaska headed next and who's leading the charge in where we're going? So Nat Hertz has started a new uh, uh, Substack page. Substack is where a lot of people go to, to write columns, op-ed columns uh, that aren't appearing in the newspaper. And, and it's a pretty good, pretty good source of information. Nat Hertz, uh, no longer with the ADN, no longer with Alaska Public Media, has started writing a, a Substack column. Um, and, and he's had some, some really good ones uh, uh, for, the, for the past few weeks. Uh, he's got a new one out. The title of it is, uh, going back to the top, title is Under Attack on Many Fronts, Ada Now Faces a Leadership Void. And it talks about the fact that uh, the Ada uh, executive director has uh, announced his resignation, uh, that he's going to go on to other things and uh, in leaving uh, that spot, the leadership spot in Ada uh, as, a, as a void. Here's the Here's the thing. I mean, Ada was set up during the Hammond administration, Ada was set up to be the government entity if we needed economic activity, if government needed to be involved in economic activity. It was going to be through Ada. It was going to be through a professionally managed, professionally operated uh, sort of venture capital fund uh, that was going to uh, that was going to uh, become involved in projects and and give backing to projects, either financing them or or underwriting their debt so they could get lower debt costs. Uh, Ada was the was the entity that was going to uh, that was going to do all that. And Ada uh, historically has played you know some role uh, in the state in trying to drive the economy. Uh, not always successful. In fact, often not successful. Uh, the the fish plant that's now a church in South Anchorage is a is a great uh, example of that. Uh, but that's been that's been where. You know, if you're going to jumpstart the economy, that's where we're going to jumpstart the economy through ADA. And Nat Hurt, Nat's article is a is a great one in terms of describing the fact that you know there's been a lot of people who have left uh, ADA, leaving it with a leadership void, and and it really is a good analysis of of you know the fact that ADA had failed, uh, was failing anyway, even with the leader even with the leadership still there was failing anyway. To explain to Alaskans its role and to and to sort of justify its existence, and to and to you know defend uh, the projects it's been involved in. So the question is, if if Alaska, if the legislature thinks, if the Senate thinks that we need to get involved, that the state needs to get involved in the economy, we need to help. That the state needs to help revitalize the economy. Who's going to do it? I mean, if Ada, if Ada is sort of falling apart. Um, if Ada can't explain, you know, what the, the activities it's involved in, who's going to do it? And, and hopefully, hopefully not the legislature directly. I mean, you, Ada was set up to, to depoliticize the process, at least make it somewhat uh, professional as opposed to the legislature, uh, the 21 and 11 plus one getting to pick and choose, you know, what industries uh, 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 got subsidized uh, uh, from the government. Ada at least was supposed to professionalize that. Uh, but if Ada is 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 not you know operating at its strongest, uh, there will be some push in the legislature to say, well, we need to do it directly because Ada Ada isn't really a, Ada isn't really a solving the problem. So there's a question. I mean, Nat raises the question: who who's going to who what's what's going to lead Alaska forward, uh, and who's going to be who's going to be leading it uh, if uh, if uh, Ada is leaderless. 
Well, it's an interesting uh, discussion, and I guess we'll see what happens from here. Again, I shudder to think every time the government says we're going to drive the economy uh, because it never works out the way that they anticipated. Uh, AD is a perfect example of that. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you for coming on board. We appreciate it. We look forward to talking to you again next week. Michael, Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.